Welcome to a special edition of Anglican Unscripted. I'm going to have a special interview with Archbishop Foley Beach, who is down in Atlanta today. Uh, you travel frequently, don't you? I'm on the road a lot. I'm finally home. It's great to be home. <laughs> and welcome to the program. Um, Thank you. You know, I get you on the the Skype here probably once every two years because you, you travel a lot and we, we see your pictures. Uh, you were on Cairo, uh, uh, around the world. You're, you're doing baptisms locally, confirmations locally. It's, uh, it's amazing to see the travels you do. Uh, tell me a little bit about the busy life of an archbishop. Well, it's, it's a, actually a, a fun challenge, but it is a challenge. I mean, I think of my schedule since assembly, which, by the way, we had a great assembly week. Um, I was able to get a little time off, but then I spent um, a week on a leadership uh, adventure with uh, young leaders uh, backpacking in, in Colorado. Um, then I uh, came back and we had an executive committee meeting. We consecrated a new bishop. Uh, we've had the conclave. Uh, I've had, in August, we had great diocesan parish visitations. Uh, Lord is doing some great work. Uh, then I went to Cairo for the, uh, actually before Cairo, we had the conclave with the bishops up in uh, Victoria, Canada. Then went to Cairo for the, the uh, Global South Primates meeting. Uh, got back from that, and then we had the Matthew 25 gathering, which uh, is, was incredible to see what God is doing uh, among the least, um, those in, in the ACNA trying to reach those who are homeless and helpless and those who don't have a voice. Just some great ministry going on there. Uh, we had a meeting with the Catechesis Task Force of the Bishops, uh, reviewing the catech uh, new catechism. Uh, it's being revised, and uh, hopefully by early next year it'll be finished, and we'll have an app and, and a, a new printing of that. Um, and then we had a building dedication, which is one of my favorite things to do now, uh, down at Christ Church Vero Beach. Uh, you know, when you dedicate a new building, it, it represents so much of what has happened in the life of that congregation, all the sacrifice, the hard work, uh, the dedication, and then everybody is joyful because it's all come together in that building. So that was really exciting. And then this weekend I was up in Quincy uh, participating in the ordination of us uh, two priests to, uh, uh, from the Karen community, uh, folks from uh, what used to be Burma, now Myanmar, uh, who live here in the United States. And um, we have a large Karen community and a tremendous ministry to them in the ACNA. All of that in the midst of trying to be a loving husband and a, a good father um, uh, to my kids. Yeah, so it's, that's that's quick. That's a quick overview. <laughs> no, it, it, it is amazing because you know my when, in the early days of the TV, we had the Lambus and the Gascons, and I thought I traveled a lot. But following your Facebook feed, uh, you are on the road a lot. You mentioned holy orders. Obviously, that's the the topic du jour um, at your election uh, to be the uh, Archbishop of the ACNA, uh, that was the number one question. Well, what's what's his election going to do for holy orders? Are we going to overturn women's orders in the church? Um, lots of concerned people because um, for a lot of people, that's the number one thing they think about, especially if they're on Facebook. Uh, and I said, well, I'm going to have Archbishop Foley Beach on. Let's talk about what happened up in Canada uh, with what you can. It was a conclave, I understand. Everybody's locked in a room, all made the promise not to talk, and uh, it worked. Nobody's talked. I can't get anybody to spill any beans about uh, <laughs> what happened. Um, is this the end of the process now? Is the biggest question. Uh, that's a great question. I think it's. Um, I think it's a huge step in the process, but I think the process is going to, you know, always continue to to uh, go on because you have folks with different positions. Um, but I think we have uh, come to a place where at this time in history we can we can pause and, and live together in a good way. Um, we did agree not to talk about what happened in the conclave. I can share with you a, you know, a couple of things that I don't think is violating the spirit of that. Um, one of the first things we did was we, we asked every bishop to, to go around and share their personal position on the issue which had not been done before, and their diocesan position. Um, and what we discovered was it's not a, a yes or no. There's a, there's a yes with 
caveats. There's no's with caveats. And, and we found that we represent a huge range of, of diversity amidst those two answers. And uh, some great heart discussion. And I have to say, and I know I've said this several times in public, but I just find it such a privilege to be around these men. I've been in ministry over 40 years now, and I've never been around such godly men uh, who love the Lord, who are who, whose character uh, emanates the character of Christ, and folks who are really seeking to please Him, and and just having that kind of leadership in our college really helped us through this. As it was, it was a. I mean, we had some very serious, heart wrenching, honest uh, discussions with each other, uh, and the statement that we released. Um, uh, I don't think anybody was happy uh, with all of it. Uh, but it was something we could all live with at this moment. Uh, so did I answer anything of what you no, asked I th- me? Yeah, I think you you answered the question as to, uh, well, the question was, is this the end of the process? You answered that uh, early on. Um, so you'll think there will be more discussions on this? Oh, I'm sure there will be, mm-hmm. yes. I don't know what forms those will take, but, you know, we've had this study that, and that's the other thing, um, you know, when this was really pushed on everybody, there had never been a study. Um, it was an equal rights kind of thing. And so we actually have some scholarship now that we can look at and evaluate and, and challenge each other on. I think that was one of the things, too, that um, a lot of us felt that, well, once people understand my position and why I hold what I do, my biblical reasons and my uh, reasons from history and, the, and the, the tradition of the church, people would convert to my position. But then we find that there's biblical reasons for the other position. And, and, and issues from the, or uh, examples from the tradition from the other perspective. And um, so it's, it's, uh, it's a good scholarly uh, beginning, I would say, of looking at this issue. Um, I think the other thing is uh, um, that we really realized in the midst of uh, preparing for this, a lot of folks wanted the bishops to be able to say, all right, we're gonna conclusively do this or we're not gonna do this. Mm-hmm. And, and, but something, that's written in the Constitution, the bishops just don't have the authority to say, we're going to change that. It has to go through the legislative process. But we, as, as the spiritual fathers, can make recommendations. Uh, but I don't think there was a consensus of, of one way or another of how we could go with that recommendation. I had a discussion with a person who's a friend in the Russian Orthodox Church. And to them, it's an important issue, too. And he said something really strange to me. He said, I don't want to see the ACNA divide over this. I'm like, you but you're Russian Orthodox. Of course you'd want to see them divide over this. He says, no, we've come too far. We're, we're in top level negotiations. We're working hard. Um, we don't want that. So there's obviously something here bigger than just the issue. Yes, um, actually, as part of the process, I petitioned each of our GAFCON uh, partners and some of our Global South partners uh, to, to speak into this. And that was the constant message that came through um, again and again. Uh, don't change anything. Uh, uh, we want you to hold together. Mm-hmm. And I guess if there's a message I would want to say to the church too is, is all of us came into the Anglican Church in North America understanding that each diocese would be able to make its own decision on this. This was what's in our constitution. Mm-hmm. And, and, and from where I came from in the, in the former outfit, um, to hold my position, I would be ostracized, put down, called names, uh, excluded from things. And all of a sudden, I'm in an, uh, an organization that affirms that I can, I can believe what I want on this issue and I can practice what I want and what I believe is right. And so we came out of this conclave holding to that and no one can force their way on someone else. So if someone's in a diocese where uh, they don't approve the ordination of women, a diocese that does cannot force that on that diocese. And, uh, and so somehow we're, we're going to continue to live in this holy tension. Um, I know it doesn't make everybody happy, um, but at the same time, uh, there are more important fish to fry. Uh, we're living in a world right now and in a culture in North America that needs the gospel. And we've got to stay on task in reaching North America with Jesus Christ. Uh, agreed. Um, let's talk a little bit about that. Um, 
let's move on and talk a little bit about the primates meeting. Uh, the Anglican Communion has a global witness to the world, and that witness is being uh, challenged. Uh, it's being grayed and ashed. Uh, people look at the Anglican Communion and say, what do they stand for? You know, it's uh, part of it is, you know, represented by the Episcopal Church and uh, now the, uh, uh, the strange uh, failings from the Church of England. Uh, and strong places like uh, uh, Nigeria. And uh, it's hard to watch disparate voices not having unity. Uh, they're almost the opposite of the ACNA at this point uh, in that. And we just had a primates meeting, uh, and I was concerned by the message coming out of there that said we're all on one page now. Uh, that stuff that was hard in Alexandria and Tanzania and other places, we're, we're beyond that. Um, is there truth to that? Um, I think it's a fallacy and an illusion. Um, I think um, Archbishop Justin and his staff uh, know how to uh, uh, create an environment to get what they wanted. Um, but it's not reality. Um, I think, uh, sadly, one of the things that we're seeing is a new narrative coming out of Lambeth and, and the Anglican Communion Office, which basically says this, we can disagree about marriage, and of course I don't hold the same position as those that, but we can disagree about that, but there's so many things we, we have in common, and that we can do together, and that we can do in mission together, and the world is in such a mess, we need to stay together, so yeah, we can disagree over this. But it shouldn't divide us. We should love one another. The unity of the church is so much more important. And, and that's being bought by so many of uh, the provinces. It sounds so good and it sounds so Christian. But when you invite pagan morality into the church and make that normalized as Christian, it's not only offense to God, but it, it's going gonna, it's gonna to keep division in place because it is not biblical and it is not Christian and um, as, as the scriptures say it's it's sinful behavior. Um, I was interested in, in the interview I did with uh, Archbishop Venables where he spoke that there you know there's also discontent within organizations like GAFCON or the Global South as to the best way forward in dealing with the Church of England um, because the, there will always be this um, desire to be in unity with them, to be uh, working with the Mother Church. Uh, and I see that all the time when I interview Global South primates uh, or talk to them, that uh, Lambeth has its attraction. Uh, Archbishop Canterbury has its attraction. Um, is GAFCON getting stronger or weaker? What are strengths and weaknesses right now? Well, first, uh, we you know, Canterbury's, I mean, as part of our history. And, mm -hmm. and the seat of Canterbury is so important, and the Church of England is so important. And that's what concerns so many of us is watching what's happening, because it's it's like dropping a bomb into the middle. We, we think what happened with TEC and the Anglican Church of Canada and the Scottish Episcopal Church has created problems. When, when the Church of England finally gives in officially, although we see stuff all around it right and in it right now that that are, are truly dividing the communion. It'll be like a bomb going off, sadly, because so much of, of our identity around the communion is wrapped up in the Archbishop of Canterbury and, and the life of the Church of England. that They founded us. So regarding GAFCON, uh, GAFCON is moving forward. It's strong. We've got um, challenges, as would be any organization. When you think about uh, most of our provinces, um, uh, including the ACNA, um, have real cultural issues that we're facing. Uh, most of our provinces don't have any resources, financial resources. Um, I think it's kind of ironic that the, uh, I think it's the, uh, the Anglican Communion Office keeps saying these North American folks are funding, Ga you know, funding GAFCON and, or not GAFCON, it's my different global leaders. I mean, we don't have any money. No, I, I, the, the reference was <laughs> we're buying off the black Africans with our money. What money? Yeah. <laughs> exactly. I mean, they're the ones that have all the money and the trust funds and the endowment funds. And, but anyway, all that being said, so that's a challenge. And then we're in all different, different time zones. So just to 
respond to something, when you think of going from Sydney to Nigeria to the U.S. to South America to Kenya, wherever it may be, uh, just to, to get us, and, and folks are out in, in uh, doing ministry out, and sometimes it may be out in the bush where there's no cell phone reception. I mean, it's a real challenge um, to just communicate with each other. So that's, that's huge. But we're all excited about GAFCON 2018 coming up. And uh, I think you'll find that that gathering, um, there's not only will be a great unity and excitement, but um, a tremendous stand for the gospel of Jesus Christ. Um, a lot of people don't know this, but Archbishops of Canterbury have a habit of keeping in contact with uh, the primates in the communion. And I had an off-the-record conversation with you in the back of a car in Texas, and you said, well, yeah, Justin talks to me all the time. What? You probably drive him crazy. No, no, no. And so uh, let the people out there in the world know that uh, um, despite what happens in the press, there is relationships among the primates. Uh, we do have a relationship. Actually, I, I like him a lot. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think he uh, really loves the Lord. I, I think he's in a, a no-win situation, but we do communicate regularly. Actually, I had an email from him last night. Mm -hmm. um, but I, um, I mean, I, I don't tell him what he wants to hear. Um, oh. <laughs> I, I tell him what I believe is the truth, and, and, and I'm sure I, I'm sadly a a sore in his saddle some, sometimes, but um, but I've grown to respect him and love him uh, as, a, as a fellow Christian. Um, I'm disappointed in the way that, um, or I should say in the direction that he is going because it seems to me that he's embracing uh, this whole, uh, what I call pagan morality uh, and normalizing it as, as part of the Christian church. And that's wrong. Mm -hmm. uh, but I, I tru truly believe he's a deep man of prayer um, and he's trying to live out the scriptures the best way he, he knows how. Um, do the primates as a whole, not just Gaffin or Global South, but do you guys keep in regular contact? Uh, a number of us do. Um, um, and the Anglican Communion um, office communicates regularly to the primates. I'm not on that list anymore um, <laughs> for obvious well, reasons. That's your fault. That's the, the, yeah, no. <laughs> um, so um, I don't say what they want me to say. Um, mm -hmm. But... Um, uh, yes, we do keep in touch with each other as much as possible. I mean, sure. the problem is we are all busy serving our provinces, and um, and we have a lot of work to do. And so you have to kind of be intentional about it. But but we do stay in touch. Well, that's the biggest difficulty is you know the bishop, the primates in Africa, the primates uh, over in Asia uh, are busier than you, if you th can think that possible. And the last thing they needed to do is think about another global Anglican crisis um, that the BBC stirred up by uh, reporting on an interview with uh, Archbishop Welby in GQ. Um, exactly. It's just, what, not, now what? And that's not the way the, the primates want to react to uh, Christendom. It's, it's something else. Well, a number of us stay in touch and pray for each other. And seriously, seriously we do pray for each other, mm -hmm. a number of us do, and uh, even share prayer needs. So, um, so that's encouraging. Well, tell me what's encouraging about Anglicanism in 2017, because in press terms, you've, you've gotten rotten press for six, 60 years now, uh, as to people watching a church, you know, swing liberal. You know, here's another one, just going to go liberal here. Um, there's no reformation, nothing happening to stop it from uh, retrajectoring itself to what has failed so many other churches. Well, I, I would disagree with that last assumption that you just made because I believe GAFCON and, and leaders of the Global South mm -hmm. are speaking and acting and doing things to counteract that. Amidst, amidst the liberal drift that we see or the direction, uh, which I would call the unbiblical drift that we see, uh, the church is growing. Uh, disciples are being made. People are coming to Jesus by faith. Um, and it's uh, actually very encouraging, the missionary activity that's going on. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm actually amazed, just the ACNA, the missionaries we have on the ground in different places and the fruit of their ministries. It's just very exciting. So in spite of, you know, what you hear in the press, the Lord is, it's his church, and uh, he's still touching people with the gospel through our feeble efforts. Let's talk a little bit about the instruments of unity. Uh, we have been told 
that this is this is the way the system works. Um, there's the Archbishop of Canterbury, there's Lambeth, the primate speeding, and the ACC. Um, I've been an, an Anglican for 25, 30 years now, and I've never seen these uh, instruments work in any function properly. Uh, is there a way we can avoid, go forward, or change the instruments in any way? Well, first, if you look at the history, the Anglican instruments of unity is a new concept. Very new. I mean, it's it's and and it isn't working. Uh, we of course we want to honor the Archbishop of Canterbury. Um, the primates meeting ought to have authority, but when they have uh, said things in the past, as we just saw with, uh, uh, or at least with the the uh, primates meeting I went to in January 2016, two months later, the Anglican Consultative Council was refusing to take their their uh, the primates council. I mean, so it's it's. Uh, it's really sad, but it's they're not working, and I, I think we need to work towards some kind of conciliar model within the communion. I mean, this would be my, we have it on every le other level of the church. In the local parish, you have folks elected to a vestry. Um, the parish sends folks to the diocese, which usually has some kind of diocesan council or synod, and uh, the diocese sends folks to the, to the province, and there's usually a provincial council or synod. Um, why aren't we doing that uh, throughout the communion. Um, we're not. Um, and the Anglican Consultative Council, if you look at what they are, they're not a legislative body. They're, they're there for counsel. That's the name of it. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, so at some point, I would hope that um, those in the leadership would really seriously look at the whole structure and, uh, and, uh, and review it and revise it. We, we truly need a reformation uh, not just spiritually, but also the organization. Uh, they're they're trying to keep the institution going, but it's not working, in my opinion. Indeed, <laughs> but it's job security for people like myself. But uh, um, and that gets me to the, kind of the final point with the ACNA uh, that I want to talk about. Great doctrine, uh, great people within the organization, but church is still tough running church, running a communion, and making all that is, you know, well done, work together, is, is difficult. Um, it really is. Um, and the local church planter who um, is out there trying to uh, lead people to the Lord and, and grow their churches, it's a real challenge. Um, but it's what we're called to do. Uh, we're in a culture now here in North America where uh, just like um, in, in other parts of the world, uh, to be a Christian, you're different. You have to make a stand. Oftentimes, you're counterculture. You're politically incorrect because you don't agree with, with the latest, whatever it might be. And, um, and it's hard. But yet, we're seeing when you stand for the gospel, when you stand for the truth, the Lord blesses that. He pours out his spirit. He brings healing to people. Um, he touches their lives. And, and so that's what we're going to continue to try to do. Yeah, it's time to start campaigning for the millennials who all want experience. It's all about experience. You want experience, let's see you at church on Sunday morning as we worship together. Um, let's finish up. A big question on most people's mind uh, after last night is, what's going on with the Falcons? <laughs> You're a lifetime um, Atlanta guy. What's going on down there? Um, they're trying to find themselves, sadly. <laughs> <laughs> a little more prayer may help them, I hope. Bishop Will Murdoch is grinning this morning. <laughs> yes, he is. <laughs> I watched you last night, and I go, it's a repeat of the Super Bowl. It's just, ah. Oh. Actually, yeah. I didn't even uh, watch it. I, yeah. went, I was busy doing other things. So, yeah. I, I, um, Well, uh, Kevin, I, I think just lastly what I'd like to say is, uh, you know, we are – in the Anglican Church in North America, what we're about is leading people into a vibrant, growing relationship with Jesus. That's what we want to do. We want to help create Anglican disciples of Jesus. We're planting churches. Uh, we're trying to feed the poor, clothe the, those who don't have clothing, show, you know, um, house the, sh um, the homeless, uh, trying to reach out to people in need and, and bring God's healing power and mercy into their lives. Uh, we serve a great God. He's awesome, and we want North America to know about him. Why well, don't thank you for your time? I, as we discussed, you're a busy person. This only happens once every two years, so uh, well, we've got to change that. I'm sorry, it's <laughs> once every two years. <laughs> it's all right. <laughs> uh, 
<clears throat> I'm a humble guy, and uh, I, I understand where I am on your totem pole. It's fine. No, no, no big deal. Archbishop, again, thank you for your time, and God bless. God bless you. Thanks, Kevin.